Good morning, everyone. Why don't we get started here? Um, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce John Kelly. In the realm of academia, Dr. John Kelly stands tall, his journey marked by notable achievements and significant contributions. He began his academic voyage at Tufts University, graduating with summa cum laude, the BS from psychology, before attaining his PhD in clinical psychology at the University of California, San Diego. He is uh, deeply embedded within the academic landscape of Harvard Medical School. Dr. Kelly holds the esteemed title of the Elizabeth R. Spallin Professor of Psychiatry and Addiction Medicine, which is a pioneering role as the first endowed professor in addiction medicine at Harvard. His influence extends broadly as he founded and directs both the Massachusetts General Hospital Recovery Research Institute and the National Center on Youth Prevention, Treatment and Recovery, uh, vital institutions in the fight against addiction. Dr. Kelly's accolades are numerous, including his tenure as the president of the American Psychological Association Society of Addiction uh, Psychology, and he's a fellow of the APA and a diplomat of the American Board of Professional Psychology. In addition to his academic pursuits, Dr. Kelly lends his expertise as a consultant to various federal agencies, non-federal institutions, and foreign governments, contributing to the global effort to fight uh, addiction. His clinical and research endeavors focus on addiction treatment, recovery mechanisms, and reducing stigma, reflecting his dedication to improving the lives of those who are suffering from the problems of addiction. Uh, please help me welcome Dr. John Kelly. Ah, good morning, everybody. Hope you can hear me okay. Um, delighted to be here. Um, Warren, thanks so much for the very kind uh, welcome, warm welcome. I'm delighted to be here, very honored to be here uh, as part of your Pioneer Series. Thank you for having me. Thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, um, and uh, it's great to know, see Warren again. So Warren and I go back a long way in the American Psychological Association, and Warren's been one of my inspirations uh, in, in my work. Um, so I've always admired the work of Warren Bickle, um, very pioneering himself, of course, and very um, esteemed, and I'm delighted to be to be here uh, as part of this uh, part of this very prestigious series. Thank you for having me. Um, so, um, and we share this common interest um, on on recovery, um, and this is a fairly new scientific focus and endeavor. Um, wasn't really taken seriously until probably the last ten years, uh, where people really started to hone in on it. And I'll tell you the story today. Uh, as I see it, and what I've experienced and noticed and observed in my career along the way, and where I think we are now and where we've come from in relation to this focus on addiction and recovery from it, and what all of that means. So um, I'm going to zoom out to begin with, kind of a 30,000 foot view um, of how we got here uh, in terms of this focus. Um, I'll talk about the active ingredients of sustained remission and, and recovery and how people achieve that. And I'll end by talking about kind of the recovery process mechanisms and some milestones that we're discovering and need to discover more of to figure out kind of who needs what, when, for what duration, at what intensity in, com in terms of services that people may need to attain and sustain remission across time. Uh, now, when you think, I mean, the title of my talk today is From Culture to Science. So um, now culturally, of course, there's been a longstanding recognition of the term recovery, the concept of recovery, without really defining what really recovery is. I think if you ask people what addiction recovery means, it means that a lot of people out in the world, they'll say, well, it means, yeah, they're not using anymore and they're, they're doing better, right? That's what kind of what recovery generally means to most people. And I think generally, I think most people in the scientific community would agree with that. But uh, culturally, it's got a, an increasing um, recognition at the federal level uh, as an organizing paradigm of addressing these endemic problems related to alcohol and other drugs that we face in the United States and also in most middle and high income countries all around the world. Uh, this is the one of the top, if not the top, public health problem facing uh, most of these uh, societies. So about uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, the federal government here in the United States 
um, uh, focused on this uh, aspect of recovery, particularly uh, when SAMHSA came along in 1992 um, as a way of empowering uh, the community. Uh, so kind of partnering with the community and, and the workforce, um, many of whom were in recovery themselves, to try and provide a positive valence paradigm um, that emphasized recovery. And you can see that the 32 years now, um, uh, the um, 34 years, um, they've been um, having a uh, recovery month in September. Um, some of you may know this, every September there is recovery month. It's been growing in kind of magnitude and uh, exposure, visibility. Um, uh, also, from a cultural perspective, you've got people like Google now hopping on board every recovery month in September, you will see on the search bar of Google, learn more about National Recovery Month. Uh, this has been happening for the last several years. So again, increasing in cultural significance and recognition um, around the country. Um, there is also, uh, in terms of fiscal appropriation and delineation of this emphasis in the, at the federal level, there is now a new Office of Recovery uh, under SAMHSA. SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, as some of you may know. And also now a mandate uh, legislation passed that all the block grants going to states from the federal government, which provide publicly funded substance use disorder treatment, must be provided for recovery support services. And I'll talk more about what those recovery support services are, because they have uh, expanded um, and are growing in terms of their prevalence as well as the evaluation of them. Uh, in terms of um, uh, recovery uh, definition, I mentioned that kind of general uh, uh, recovery definition. Uh, there's now also been an emphasis on recognizing recovery and putting an operational definition on recovery for what it's worth. As I mentioned, you know, recovery, as a, you know, from a cultural perspective, has a generally positive uh, uh, meaning. Um, and um, people have argued that you know, recovery is not just about subtraction of symptoms. So, like we might think about remission, think about remission. You don't have the disease anymore, so you're in remission from it. So people would say, well, recovery is more than that. It's more than just the subtraction of symptoms where you just have remission, but rather what's been added. The people have talked about this in terms of kind of a self-actualization. And I think moreover, and you, this is not unique to addiction, but people will talk about um, kind of functioning better, not just in spite of having had the disease or disorder, but because of it. So one of my friends, for example, who had cancer, went to school with him years ago. He said to me, I'll never forget it, about 10 years ago, I called him up, hadn't spoken to him for 25 years. He said, yeah, I've been seriously ill from cancer. He said, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. Interesting comment, right? The best thing that ever happened to me because his life now, he said, was like a kind of a new technicolor version of life. He got a much more intensive life, much better uh, experience of life, which was quite a remarkable statement, of course. And it's that kind of thing that people often talk about when they, particularly who have been ravaged by addiction, who've had very severe addiction problems, will say the same kind of thing is that my life now is much, much better than I ever could have imagined because of, not just in spite of. Um, it was kind of a hobby for a while for people to come up with their own definition. Uh, I don't know if you did, Warren, but I did. Um, it's kind of like, you know, come up with your own definition of what recovery is, and lots of people have done it and organizations. Um, but you can really boil it down to um, really that top one, Sam series, a process of change through which individuals improve their health and well-being live a self-directed life and achieve, strive to achieve their full potential. Um, there is also, you know, with SAMHSA, because SAMHSA isn't just about addiction, it's about mental health more broadly, and there is, has been efforts to kind of create this overarching idea of recovery as an organizing positive paradigm across not just addiction, but mental health. Okay, so this is why you get these very broad definitions oftentimes. Uh, you notice the one up the top has nothing to do with remission, doesn't talk about substance use itself or remission. Uh, some, of the, some of the other ones do uh, that are more specific to addiction recovery. But generally, it's, again, 
it's 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 no use or uh, remission or abstinence or minimal use plus improved quality of life and functioning. That's generally um, uh, the way it's it's described. Um, it's also uh, talked about as a you know as a, as a category as well as a dimension. So you can be quote in recovery and not in re in recovery. Okay, so what what what's the difference? Okay, what happens between someone saying, "Wait a minute, I'm in recovery now, but I wasn't last week or the month before"? Or the... so there's something that is changing qualitatively where someone will say, "Yeah, I'm in recovery now, but I wasn't before." And then there's course of degrees of recovery. So I'm, you know, really feeling strong and robust in recovery, or I'm, 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 I'm not feeling very strong or, or robust in recovery. So there's kind of a dimensional aspect to it too within the category, just like the syndrome of addiction itself. Um, what we don't have is um, kind of markers of resilience other than time. So how do you know, for example, someone with three years or five years of re re quote recovery? How susceptible are they or near are they to a relapse? What would make you, in other words, what would make you worried about someone who had five years, told you they had five years or seven years of continuous remission and recovery? And it's those kinds of things that we need to kind of think about. Okay, well, yeah, what would be the things that I would worry about um, somebody if my, my, one of my family members or close friend or spouse uh, or son or daughter uh, had that amount of time what make me concerned or worried that they were on the verge of a relapse. And these are the kinds of things uh, that we need to kind of get better at um, because time itself, yes, it's correlated with more time. The longer you're in remission and in recovery, the more likely it is that you will stay there, um, but it's not a cure. Uh, and these are the constituent parts of um, uh, kind of what is what people would talk about and, and think about as, as being the kind of ingredients or components of, of, um, of, of recovery. Um, the, the SAMHSA um, uh, pillars of recovery are health, home, community, and purpose, for example, very broad dimensions, but these are some of the aspects reflected also. This was a big study, a multi uh, 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 meta-analysis um, or systematic review of mental health recovery. So this is asking hundreds of studies asking people from in recovery from mental health disorders uh, by a woman named Mary Leamy. Uh, and she identified this CHIME um, acronym, community, hope, identity, a positive social identity, meaning and purpose and empowerment. These were kind of the ingredients that she derived from all these uh, studies that have been done on people with uh, in recovery from mental health disorders. There's Recovery capital, different dimensions, which I'll talk about in more detail, and then social support models of uh, recovery. The, the notion, I like this quote from Elvin Morton Jelinek um, on, on def definition, because the question is, you know, well, why define recovery? Um, and I like what Jelinek says in the disease concept of alcoholism. He says there are more definitions of the word definition in the dictionary than alcoholism. And this should communicate that definition of itself is nothing sacred and cannot be disputed for correctness unless it goes against the rules of the defining process, but one can argue about its utility. So the notion of utility, what's the point um, of defining it? And I think of recovery oftentimes, and I make this parallel, it's, it's a bit like defining health. You know, if you can come up with a good definition of what health is, the World Health Organization has been trying to do this for decades. Um, uh, in terms of defining health, it's a bit like that. It's kind of like, well, yeah, how would you put a you know, descriptive or operational definition on health? How would you describe someone's health? Is it just the absence of disease means you're healthy? Uh, some people would argue that. In fact, that used to be, used to be the definition, but now it's gone beyond that. Um, now, the moving towards the science aspect, uh, the, the, the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism here in the United States has decided that it came, wanted to come up with an operational definition of recovery. Um, so this was a, um, a, a, a multi-pronged you know, um, effort uh, with lots of consultation with people around the country, including myself, um, on what is recovery and could they come up with an operational definition so we could study it, okay? So this is the idea. Otherwise, you've got all these very you know, vague descriptive definitions, which you saw all those kind of nice descriptive de definitions, we definitely capture the essence of recovery. NIAAA, the largest alcohol research institute in the world, 
wanted to put an operational definition on recovery. So this is what they came up with. A very simple, concrete um, definition. This is uh, basically it. So remission plus non-heavy drinking because of the toxicity related aspects. Um, so it's not just about functioning. This is something important. Some people will say, well, if as long as someone's functioning well, they could be drinking or using other drugs. And uh, But if their functioning is, is getting better, maybe that's all that counts. But you don't, don't forget, drugs, alcohol and other drugs cause harm in different ways. So you could have liver disease, but be functioning well through alcohol, chronic alcohol use. You could have uh, an increased cancer risk from alcohol, despite functioning well and going to work. And uh, so there are other aspects of health beyond psychosocial functioning, which um, a, a good example of which would be tobacco addiction. So nicotine addiction, functioning is fine with tobacco, but you're getting increasingly sicker over time um, because of chronic uh, uh, tobacco smoke inhalation, et cetera. Um, yeah, now, what NIAAA did was they also said there are these kind of also adjunct aspects, which I'll talk about in more detail. This comes from a biaxial formulation, which I put forth a few years ago. But the idea here is that this remission plus non-heavy drinking equals recovery, but also, even though this is not part of the uh, necessary part of the definition, these are some of the positive aspects that go along with remission plus on heavy drinking. In other words, when people get into remission and they stop using or using heavily, generally they start to feel better, do better and function better. And they start to accrue many of these things. And many of these things then go on to help the person uh, to sustain remission. And they came up with these um, milestones, uh, which are very similar to remission milestones uh, that we have for diagnostic remission from the disorder of substance use disorder, initial, early, sustained, and stable. Again, there's not a whole lot of empirical basis for these, but they're good things to begin with so we can start to assess and say, well, are they useful or not? So what's the point? I think the point here with the NIAAA definition, a formal publicized um, uh, definition is that it adds scientific legitimacy to the cultural concept of recovery for the first time, in my view. Open door is opens the door to recovery research paradigms that will investigate this interplay of these variables over time. Um, it moves away from complete abstinence alone as the primary endpoint, which was a big part of a lot of research in the last 50 years. Um, uh, so because you don't have to be abstinent to be in remission. Now, abstinent remission is more stable than non-abstinent remission, but you can still be in remission from a substance use disorder while still using uh, to some degree. Um, and um, it accurately conceptualizes many of the component parts of what many consider to be recovery. So it has cultural validity and utility in, in terms of its, its, of its, of its um, definition but only partly operationalizes these, uh, which is uh, those aspects um, of improved quality of life and functioning. We don't know, for example, now what degree of function improvements in quality of life and functioning would be the, the, the threshold for being in recovery, as it were, versus not. So this is where it gets a little, a little fuzzy. So again, just in terms of, um, you know, where we are now in terms of um, how we got here, a couple of years ago, we reached a 50-year milestone in the United States since the declaration of the war on drugs under Nixon in 1971. So it was a 50 years. So I've been reflecting on, you know, well, what have we learned in 50 years since that initial declaration, that concerted federal focus and effort um, on this kind of what was been, has been termed the war on drugs and in, in the last 50 years? And there's a lot, right? If you zoom out and think about what have you learned in 50 years I mean, one of the things that happened, of course, was the birth of NIAAA in 1970 and NIDA in 1974. Those two institutes have produced 90% of the world's research on addiction in the last 50 years. Uh, and a lot has come out. There's also been shifts in, I think, underwritten by the research that has come out um, um, in the last 50 years, has shifted our cultural perception of the nature of addiction and substance use disorders. Um, I think, um, you know, one example, for example, is, you know, uh, Nixon famously declared, quote unquote, drug abuse in 1971 as public enemy number one. That was 
classic statement from his address where he uh, declared the war on drugs. You can still see that on YouTube. I think today we wouldn't talk about it as our as a public enemy number one, but rather a top public health problem. That shift in rhetoric and emphasis reflects a shift, a broad shift away from criminal justice approaches towards broader public health approaches to quote unquote the drug problem. We've learned a lot, underwritten again, these attitudes have changed and emphasis has changed um, uh, because of the, uh, the science that's been produced uh, in terms of all of these things, in terms of etiology, epidemiology, neurobiology, um, typology, uh, the pathways into, through, and out the other side, we've learned a ton of uh, these things, uh, which has produced a number of paradigm shifts, uh, particularly regarding stigma and our understanding of blame, you know, in terms of blaming the person for having the disorder. We understand much more now about susceptibility. It's an interaction between personal susceptibility and environmental uh, exposure and accessibility to the substances, of course. Uh, and so there's been a lot of work on genetics and genomics and pharmacogenetics. Uh, we're used to seeing these colored images now of brains. You know, this is a fairly new thing, the functional imaging that can be done to actually look inside the living brain of what happens to people when they're exposed to different stimuli, including drugs, and look at the change both in terms of deterioration as a, as a function of these maladaptations as well as neurotoxicity, but also in the absence of the substance where Mother Nature can do the reparative work and we can start to see milestones in terms of recovery in the brain as shown here. From a psychosocial standpoint in the 1980s, again, the last zooming out in the last 50 years, we had the stages of change which has helped us to conceptualize and think about, okay, we've got these stages of change. How can we map onto these stages different kinds of interventions? For example, when someone's pre-contemplative or contemplative, we can start to not do nothing, but rather provide harm reduction services as well as motivational services that can help people way up in a non-threatening way, help them way up and, and, and evaluate where they are and where they might want to go in, in recognition of some of the harms that they may not be aware of. Uh, so harm reduction, of course, has been around for a long time, but particularly we've seen it come front and center with the opioid crisis uh, in terms of needle exchanges, medications, agonist medications in particular, as well as uh, overdose prevention facilities. But as I mentioned, you know, we've had many paradigm shifts in the last 50 years in terms of psychosocial treatments, again, mapping on uh, to these new conceptualizations, which came about as a result of research on principally on tobacco, but the notion of pre-contemplation and contemplation, that we don't do nothing, but rather begin to engage people where they're at. Don't leave them where they're at, but help them uh, be able to evaluate properly. Um, we've had relapse prevention in the 1980s, courtesy of work by Alan Marlett, as well as um, uh, Terry Gorski and others, contingency management. These are all the big ticket items. Now we've had um, the the kind of third wave, so-called third wave, kind of where e East meets West in terms of um, psychotherapy and, and, and using the best of things from around the world as the world has become a smaller place. Uh, we've adopted and adapted things to incorporate into things that people find attractive and engaging, including things like radical acceptance and mindfulness and other ideas. Very importantly, uh, methadone uh, has been a crucial um, uh, innovation and discovery in the treatment of, ad of addiction, as, as, as has nicotine replacement, to reduce cravings um, while people can uh, focus on, on other recovery aspects. In fact, one of my colleagues, Keith Humphrey, says, you know, the two biggest things in the, hundred, in the last hundred years of addiction treatment, the two biggest things to happen in the field is methadone and Alcoholics Anonymous. The two biggest, most impactful things to happen, two very disparate kinds of ideas, but two biggest things to happen in terms of the effect that's had at the population level uh, and the clinical level in terms of helping people to attain and sustain uh, remission. Digital health, this is a fairly new, the fact that we can reach people now, of course, this has been a silver lining of COVID, has been a realization, a forced realization that we can, wait a minute, we had this before, but nobody was paying that much attention to it. But now there's a kind of a new realization of the, of the significance of being able to reach people in rural areas, for example, people who, who find it very difficult to get into a, an urban area to see a provider can use digital. And we have the technology now uh, to be able to do this. People like William White, 
uh, Chuck O'Brien, Tom O'Clellan, Tom McClellan have talked about for a long time treating addiction as a chronic illness. You've probably heard of this, uh, that addiction is a chronic relapsing disease or disorder. This is the way it's often talked about um, at top levels of federal government, for example. It's not for everybody, okay, because we have a very broad spectrum of substance involvement and impairment in the, in the spectrum of substance use disorder, right? We have these 11 criteria. If, you're, if you get two or more, you're in the category. But you can have anywhere from two to 11. So you can have mild, moderate, and severe levels of involvement and impairment. But on the severe end of the spectrum, these disorders tend to have a chronic relapsing remitting course. Um, and so we talk about this as addiction. Addiction being the more severe end of, of, this, of that spectrum of substance involvement and impairment. And uh, uh, I put this together a few years ago just to highlight how the kind of chronicity and long timeline um, for the typical career, if you will, of substance involvement for people who are addicted. These are data taken from the severe end of the spectrum. So these are adult clinical cases uh, depicted here in this summary graphic. You can see that um, it takes uh, a long time to get into remission. The good news is most people will actually get into remission who have a substance use disorder. These are fairly new discoveries in terms of from an epidemiological perspective. Uh, about four to five years after the onset of a substance use disorder before it start, before people start to seek help. Part of that's due to you know attempts to try and control and cut down as best they can, as well as the stigma and fear of discrimination, which prevent people from acknowledging or from talking about uh, discussing these issues because they're worried about what people will think. Um, and then another eight years on average in adult clinical samples and about four to five treatment episodes before people will achieve that first year of full sustained remission. So this is quite a long time. What tends to happen here is that people get longer and longer periods of abstinence and early remission before they achieve that first year of full sustained remission. That's 12 months symptom free, okay? Uh, no, no, no more symptoms than just craving. Um, and what's also noteworthy from a chronic disease management perspective is that even after the achievement of that first year of full sustained remission, it takes about five years on average before the risk of meeting criteria in the following year for substance use disorder drops below 15%. Why 15%? Because that's the average annual risk in the general population in any given year of meeting criteria for an alcohol or other drug use disorder. So to be no more likely than anybody else in the general population of meeting criteria in the following year, if you already had it, takes five years of continuous remission. So risk remains elevated for that first five year period, even after initial remission. So there's a kind of a healing process that goes on inside the human organism and in their lifestyle adaptation to recovery, uh, which makes them vulnerable relative to the general population, uh, are more vulnerable to meeting criteria in the following year. Now, uh, the obvious question, of course, um, that Dr. Warren Bickel asked me many years ago, you probably don't even remember this, but um, is can we speed this up? Do you remember asking me this question? So this is a brilliant question by Dr. The brilliant Dr. Bickel here, um, uh, who asked me this question. And I thought, you know what, it's so right, yeah. In other words, is this an, an, an inexorable course of the illness? You just have to wait eight years um, before someone, on average, before someone is, gets into, into initial remission, full sustained remission, and then wait, another, wait around for another five years? Or is it modifiable? Are there things that we can do to speed it up, right? So this is a, a very good question. And I often use this burning building metaphor to really kind of uh, summarize the things that we've learned in, in the last 50 years. And I think what we can do to help speed up the process of recovery, time to initial and sustained remission. Um, I think if we've done one thing right in the last 50 years is recognize that there is a crisis. This is what Nixon did back in 1971. There is an endemic and epi intermittently epidemic crisis that happens over these years with different substances. Alcohol is always there. Now up to 180,000 deaths a year from alcohol every year and 107,000 now with poisoning deaths attributable to opioids and other drugs. But if we've done one thing right, we've recognized the building is on fire. There is a crisis. The building is on fire. We need to put the fire out. We've done a good job, I would argue, in the last 50 years of putting the fire out. Detoxification, stabilization protocols, and 12 weeks of acute care treatment. These were, this is where most of the focus, very importantly and necessarily, has needed to be 
uh, focused is on this initial area. We've got to put the fire out first before you can do anything else. So detoxification, stabilization, 90% of the clinical trials have been 12-week trials in the last 50 years. 12 weeks of psychosocial treatment, usually manualized increasingly. Then you remove the treatment and you follow people up for a year and you find out, look to see how they did. Pharmacology, same kind of thing. 12 weeks of some kind of uh, ph pharmacological intervention, remove the uh, medication and see how people do. Um, and that's the way it's gone. Again, um, not a bad thing. That's been very important. But where we have dropped the ball, I think, is recognizing how do we prevent the fire from restarting? And most notably, how do we provide the scaffolding and the building materials that people need to be able, or access to these materials and scaffolding to be able to rebuild their life? And also, very importantly, is the building permit. Oftentimes, people are denied a building permit in other words, they can't even get their life back on track because they can't get a job, they can't get a loan, they can't get housing, they can't get in, back into college because of a prior criminal felony conviction related to something that they can't change. Uh, and so this residue, this re residual effect of this felony conviction prevents them from getting a building permit and getting access to these building materials, which can help instill hope and optimism for the future. Nothing will take the wind out of somebody's sails and telling them, now, despite the fact that you're motivated for recovery and you're motivated for change, I'm sorry, because of these prior convictions, you can't get a job, you can't get a loan, you can't get housing. This will is demoralize something, somebody like nothing else. So we think about these building materials and the scaffolding, the building permits as recovery capital. You can think about it as recovery capital. What is recovery capital? It's really the sum amount of all the resources, internal and external, that somebody can draw on in their recovery bank account, if you will, um, to um, to be able to recover, okay? So all of these different facets, so my mental health, my motivation, my coping, um, my self-efficacy, um, and as well as the social environment, very importantly, finances, income, having a job, uh, cultural uh, aspects of it. Um, now, the recovery capital, of course, the social factors, the building materials, the building permit, the scaffolding can help offset what we now know to be some of the underlying vulnerabilities to addiction relapse, uh, things like increased sensitivity to stress, as well as a down-regulated reward pathway as a function of oversensitization, overstimulation, um, or, or, um, abnormally high levels of reward and reinforcement, which occur uh, with drugs. And of course, when people are detoxified in those first couple of weeks and they're stabilized metabolically, it doesn't mean that they're out of the woods, right? As I mentioned, there's still a susceptibility, a vulnerability, a reverberation that happens inside the human organism for many months, even years, which makes them more susceptible. We call these post-acute withdrawal phenomena. Uh, and they are susceptible to Q-reactivity for many months and many years as well. Uh, the other thing from a cognitive uh, uh, bias perspective is that the overlearned cognitive bias towards continued use is that drugs are immediate, potent, and predictable, and the rewards of recovery are delayed, diffuse, and variable. So you've got an immediate bias. I can relieve this. I know how to relieve this pain and suffering that I'm experiencing, this difficult time navigating the path of recovery. Um, so it makes it very, again, biasing towards continued use. From a stress and coping perspective, uh, we can think about the demands of recovery. So from a theoretical perspective, uh, it can be helpful to think about uh, different theories. And I think the stress and coping model is a good one. Uh, and many of you may know the, the work of Hans, Feely, uh, Hans Seeley and, and McEwen looking at allostasis and, and how organisms experience stress and become sickened by stress. Um, this is the general adaptation syndrome from the 1950s. Um, but it fits for me a kind of a paradigm of addiction as well in the recovery paradigm of addiction. Um, this is actually the general adaptation syndrome that was described by Hans Seeley back in the 1950s, where organisms experienced an alarm response. Um, they reacted, they try and resisted the stress, but they became exhausted and they got sick or died. Um, this also fits uh, an addiction recovery paradigm. There's usually an alarm event which causes someone to say, okay, this is it, this is the last time, I'm, out. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stop, I mean it, this time it's gonna happen. And they may well mean it. And they try and they keep trying and they hold on, they can hold on for a while. Um, 
there is this kind of motivation and ready, willing, and able aspect to, to recovery. But what happens is it depends on the nature of the environment, right? What are the environmental conditions that somebody is facing? Do they have a job? Do they have social support? Do they have the right kind of environment uh, that can help uh, initiate and sustain change over time? Because what happens is they can only hold on for so long. And this is what we see is that the human organisms start to decay. They start to fall off. They lose hope, especially when they can't get the building permit and access to the building materials and they become exhausted. So this is where the, this becomes very important, this concept of uh, building materials. And I think it's a biaxial thing. Um, if you remember back to um, uh, Griffith Edwards um, back at Maudsley Hospital in the 1970s, if you know this literature from where the addiction syndrome came from, uh, it came from a paper um, published by Edwards and Gross, um, really delineating uh, what, what they called a biaxial formulation of the dependence uh, syndrome. And what it was essentially was that, was this scenario was that as the uh, addiction, in other words, the thing, the changes that happened inside the brain as a result of chronic exposure, the brain changes through neuroadaptation and neurotoxicity, those changes uh, produce impairments. So the other axis was which became abuse in DSM-3 um, are, the, are the consequences, the impairments that happen, psychosocial impairments, can't go to work, have social relationship problems because of what's the change up here in the brain as a result of exposure. Um, and so it was a kind of a, what they described as a biaxial formulation. Um, what I've added here is the fact, they didn't talk about this, but I think what happens is as these consequences accrue, as, a, as the changes in the brain, this only serves to increase stress, the biobehavioral stress feedback loop, so that the person feels more stressed out because of the consequences that have come about because of the changes in the brain. And that, what, what does that do? It only serves to increase ongoing addiction, and that's, that's why it's a biaxial formulation. Now, what I proposed here is essentially the same thing is true of remission. And recovery, recovery is a biaxial formulation also. As people get into early remission, their mental health starts to improve, their motivation increases, their self-efficacy increases. So you get these positive consequences of remission. Those positive consequences of remission help to sustain remission, okay? So the kind of the recovery capital that begins to accrue and that can be provided uh, helps to sustain uh, remission by reducing this biobehavioral allostatic load uh, through recovery capital. So it's a biaxial formulation. Early remission produces more recovery capital, more recovery capital can help sustain remission by reducing this from a stress and coping uh, standpoint. So just in summary, um, for this first section, there's been a growing cultural significance of the recovery paradigm in the last 50 years. The federal focus is intended to empower lived experience and help to destigmatize from an advocacy uh, perspective. There's increasing clinical and research focusing on defining recovery. There's now a formal operational definition put out by the National Institutes of Health. Numerous short-term acute care focused interventions have accumulated, but there's been a greater recognition of the underlying neurobiological, cognitive, psychological deficits and models of recovery capital, increased recognition for the need for long-term disease management or recovery management uh, paradigms, which has led to this rethinking uh, beyond short-term stabilization, where we spent most of our energy and effort so far on those first 12 weeks uh, to extensive models of care, much like we would do for hypertension or diabetes. So we would have regular checkups and check-ins to see how people are doing. They may be doing great. Give them a thumbs up, uh, encourage them to continue. And uh, there have been new models of, of this. Yeah. Is this an assumption that there are no other comorbidities, psychiatric comorbidities or other comorbidities? No, they're all, they're all mixed in here. They're all mixed yep. in Yeah, that's all part of the... Uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk about some of the moderators of this, but uh, in general, this is this is what what is happening. And there's, you know, there's about with people coming into treatment, about 50% will have a current psychi other psychiatric illness. Um, about 70% will have history history plus current. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned the the time was a way to quantify like how much how much the person was in recovery. Are there, and then you said it was the early slide where 
something was missing, could you use the amount of recovery capital that the person has, like how many urges they've overcome or how much help they've sought out? Maybe they're planning for the future now. Are those kind of ways to yeah. quantify that in addition to mm -hmm. time, like, like the time that they haven't used or maybe they're using less? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's certainly one, one way to go, right? Is to look at, you know, how motivated someone is, how capable someone is. Um, do they have a job? Do they have a supportive family? Do they have um, a good intentions of, you know, positive intentions of maintaining abstinence, et cetera? Um, uh, so all of those things could be good factors, again, to test out empirically. Yeah. And, and those things have proven to be true. Uh, so we, don't, we know less about the long term than we do about the short term. We know a lot about the first six months, the first year. We know less about from year three to four, or four to five, or five to six in terms of these factors. But you would, you would think that those, many of those factors, resilience factors, would come into play. Yeah. And that's kind of where the, the building permits come in, right, in the longer term. Well, that comes in right out of the gate, right? Because if you think about it, if I'm if I'm in detox and I'm you know I'm, I'm there for two weeks and I'm maybe going to residential and going back home, um, and I want to get back, I'm motivated and I want to get back into into uh, get a job and 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 get, maybe go back to school, but I can't get a loan because of a prior conviction, then that that prevents me. That can take the wind out of my sails right away. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, another, another analogy uh, that's useful, I think, is, is kind of thinking through how, how other organisms recover from disease and illness. And uh, if you think about uh, plant organisms, for example, um, uh, there's only so much we can do to work on a plant organism that's, that's become sickened and is, is diseased and dying. So what do we do? We provide the right, you know, a better soil, might try put it in a different pot with some new soil, give us some fertilizer, give us some, the right light and the right moisture, and it'll start to do well. In other words, when the environment is right, the organism can survive and even flourish. I think of addiction recovery is similar to photosynthesis, but it's kind of like a psychosynthesis in a way, in that if we provide the right kinds of conditions then a kind of psychosynthesis can occur in the human organism by which Mother Nature can help heal the organism from the poisoning, chronic poisoning um, that has happened over time. And I think these four elements are the kind of big ticket items. I think of the social environment as the soil through which all the other nutrients are absorbed and exchanged. Uh, is that social environment. It could be the clinical social, it could be peer support, family, but it's that um, uh, social environment that is the place where it all happens in terms of uh, recovery skills building, optimism and hope, which can help sustain people over time. Physical activity is another big one. So just building res physical resilience, which is associated with mental health and mental health functioning and resilience. Nutrition, very important. Just eating three meals a day early on for someone with an addiction problem is a big deal. But then incorporating a hopefully balanced diet with antioxidants can help brain health, functioning, and resilience. Arguably, emotion regulation is a consequence of the other three here, but also can be directly affected through therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness-based relapse prevention, et cetera, uh, to spirituality that can help people find meaning and, and hope, optimism, uh, and emotion regulation. So that spells this nice acronym, SANER, a SANER approach uh, to recovery. These four big ticket items can uh, converge and interact to help the human organism uh, with the right conditions to be able to uh, survive and flourish. Um, so if you kind of think about the neuroscience of recovery capital, we know that, of course, the brain um, can be affected by what we put inside it through medications. That's very important. Um, buprenorphine, methadone, nicotine replacement, alcohol medications can help mitigate the post-acute withdrawal phenomena that can help people in sustain, sustain recovery over time. But very interestingly, these social factors can be very important as well. Um, you think about the four main reasons why people use substances, um, they are to feel better, to, 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 to feel better, to feel good, to feel better, to do better, performance enhancement, or because other people are using them. It's interesting when you think about the four main reasons why people stop, which are to feel good, to feel better, to do better, because other people are not doing it. 
The train leaves the station, everything's going great. Picks up speed, this is fantastic, I'm loving this. Train starts to go too fast, comes off the rails a little bit, wait a minute, I wanna get off, but I can't stop the train. So this, the same reasons why people start, the same reasons why people stop, due to this change that happens in the brain. This neuroadaptation, the maladaptations, and the toxicity produces this over time. What was the best of times, it becomes the worst of times. Um, and also, very importantly, from a recovery standpoint, is that these social factors seem to be key. This is a study we just finished um, looking at the top reasons why people in smart recovery, which is a mutual health group, cognitive behavioral mutual health group, and AA, which is another uh, mutual health group for recovery, um, what they liked and what they found helpful about these different um, uh, entities in terms of the recovery across these four different um, theories of recovery of uh, 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 theories. And you can see at the top here, right across, they all contain this social, this is this tens of social, feeling the same as other people who have the same illness, um, social network. This is the top rated, um, overall, the top rated element of what they found most helpful with this social component. Um, social relationships, of course, have been implicated not just in well-being, psychological well-being, but in uh, mortality risk. And this, some of you may know this meta-analysis that was done by Julianne holt lundstedt which showed that loneliness and isolation independently, whether you felt lonely or whether socially isolated, either of those two, had the same magnitude of health uh, negativity uh, aspects to it as smoking over time. So it resulted. So those, those social factors, it's primates, so important, not just to psychological well-being and health, but to physical health. Again, looking at these um, uh, aspects of stress, we know that social buffering um, we now have explications, more and more detailed uh, neuroendocrinological explanations of how our desire, we know it intuitively, when we're feeling upset or down, what do we do? We go to a friend, a therapist, a colleague, might say, you know what, I'm feeling really lousy. This, this is, you know, it's really screwing with my head. And you talk about it and you feel better. And there's, of course, there's a, there's a biological substrate and neuroendocrinological, we're starting to uncover that. Also, in terms of the dopamine pathway. The dopamine pathway is down-regulated as a function of these abnormally high levels of reward and reinforcement, which come from drugs, okay? So there's an adaptation, a maladaptation that occurs um, through uh, this chronic high uh, exposure to these abnormally high levels. What we know when you abstain is that social factors can help upregulate these down-regulated. And this is a nice um, graph here, to, just showing the magnitude of the relationship between the upregulation of these downregulated dopamine pathways and social status and social support. Social status, you can think of as autonomy and access to resources. So if you have access to resources, again, the building materials, the building permit, the scaffolding, you are likely to experience these upregulation, these downregulated uh, pathways. Now, this is in part why we've seen this huge growth in the last 20 years of so-called recovery support services and peer support all across the federal government, all across the advocacy community, and now into the scientific community. There is a strong emphasis at NIAAA and NIDA, and it's been around a long time in NIMH, NIMH-funded research on peer support people with lived experience supporting other people who are earlier in the process of recovery. In the addiction field, there's been this huge growth of mutual help organizations, of course, the oldest being 12-step, but there's many other newer ones, Smart Recovery, Life Ring, Women for Sobriety, all these different flavors now of recovery support services, as well as recovery housing, recovery coaching, recovery community uh, Recovery community centers, recovery high schools, there's collegiate recovery programs. You have those here in, in Virginia, embedded in places where our people are likely to find themselves. Again, these things are a good match for the undulating susceptibility over these early years in recovery, okay? But they're less expensive, okay? So they're not your acute care overnight, medically managed, medically supervised, detoxification, stabilized. That's very expensive medical care. These are extensive interventions which are uh, accessible and available, usually for free, in the communities in which people live and work. So they're a good match for people's adaptation to the demands of recovery. 
what do we have in terms of uh, evidence? Now we have a pretty mature evidence in some of these uh, evidence base in some of these areas. This is a Cochrane review we conducted in published in 2020, where we looked at all of the scientific uh, evidence. These are 27 randomized controlled trials looking at 12-step facilitation. So this is people with severe alcohol addiction being randomly assigned to receive a linkage to Alcoholics Anonymous or a linkage to something like cognitive behavioral therapy or motivation enhancement therapy, for example, and they're followed up up to three years. Um, and so uh, all of that literature was subjected to the same kind of scientific standard as we would subject other, other interventions through the Cochrane Library. And what did we find? Very pow powerfully, the effect of randomly assigning patients with severe alcohol addiction, drinking 16 to 21 drinks a day, coming into treatment, um, 20 to 60% higher rates of remission across the first three years of treatment relative to patients assigned to CBT or MET. They did as well on every single other outcome except long-term remission. So assigning people to a linkage to a community-based resource like AA can produce these higher rates of sustained remission across time. This is good news. Not only that, when you look at the economic benefits, 10 to $15 billion in cost savings nationally from linking patients to AA and better outcomes, okay? So these are 2018 dollars. So it's more like 20 million billion dollars uh, right now. We're also understanding how these interventions work, these peer support interventions. In this case, it's Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, what we have found with the research on AA is that AA, as an exemplar, mobilizes, what we have found is that it mobilizes the same kinds of therapeutic mechanisms that are mobilized by clinical interventions like CBT but it does so over the long term in the communities in which people live. So for example, it helps to change the social network, most importantly, and it helps to build these coping skills. Cognitive behavioral coping skills go up for people who go to AA because they learn from peers who are li that li lived experience how to stay sober. Um, they also boost the, these other things that reduce impulsivity and craving. So that's why I call AA and groups like it the closest thing that public health has to a free lunch. But of course, not everybody wants to go to, to AA, right? So this is why there's been this growth in these other mutual help organizations. The metaphor I use is a bit like a fitness center. Uh, and I'm running out of time here. Um, but um, the, the, uh, I think this fitness center uh, analogy is a good one. Um, you know, the question I ask audiences is, do fitness centers keep people fit? Well, yeah, but you have to go, right? You've got to go to the fitness center, you've got to go work out. Now, fitness centers know that um, you have to get people to come back, right? So when you walk into a fitness center, do you just see 40 cross trainers and that's it, 40 elliptical machines? Now, it's true, it's true that if you work out on the elliptical machine three times a week or more, you will get physically fit. That is a scientific fact, okay? You work out in a certain period. Now, but no, if you don't want to work out on the cross trainer, you're going to walk out of there, right? So what do they do? They've got 40 different classes. They've got swimming pools, courts, all kinds of classes. Why? Because they want to attract and engage more people in the pro some kind of activity that will get them to come back, okay? Um, now, this makes total sense, right? They, they, would, they would do that because they want to get people moving, okay, into something. I'm not going to do I'll do a Zumba class or do a yoga class maybe or I'll do something else, but I'm not going to get on the cross trainer. Um, or I'll go swimming, or I'll, so that's what they've got this huge array of things that will attract and engage more people. Now we think about recovery support services. So far, we've had largely one thing, the cross trainer, AA, 12 step, that's been pretty much your option, right? So if you don't like AA or 12 step, even though it's true, scientifically true now that we can prove, yes, AA does actually help people keep people fit for recovery, right? We've got very strong data. But if you don't want to work out in AA, as it were, right, what do you do? Now we've got a whole slew of other kinds of recovery support services, mutual help organizations, as well as recovery community centers. Um, and these are growing and expanding all the time. In other words, not just vanilla, but we've got all kinds of flavors, okay, that people are going to like and they can get involved in and attracted by. The evidence is emerging also that is rather than relative efficacy, like I said, less about um, you know, is AA better than Smart Recovery or Life Ring or one of these other uh, groups? It's more about what's your flavor? 
What's the thing that you're going to work out on? What piece of equipment do you need to work out to get fit for recovery? Um, and what we're finding, for example, in a recent study with Smart Recovery, which is a cognitive behavioral relapse prevention group, uh, like AA, but a cognitive behavioral flavor of it, um, is that people who go to Smart Recovery tend to have less severe clinical histories and much, much more recovery capital, and more income, more education. But isn't that great? Now there's an option for people who have that kind of phenotype of addiction and recovery, they can self-select into something that can they can use to help them sustain remission over time because they don't go to AA for, for explicit reason. They'll go to another. So that, again, it's expanding the repertoire of options in the recovery gym, if you will. Uh, so that's what's happened. And the same is true of all of these other, um, I'm running out of time to stop now, but the, um, what we're finding is that the same kind of cost benefit uh, through recovery housing, through recovery community centers, through collegiate recovery programs and recovery high schools and recovery coaching models, any kind of extensive intervention that follows on from this more intensive intervention has shown to be effective and cost effective when it's been subjected to scientific analysis and evaluation. So that's the good news. The good news is that, that these things are very cost effective, like AA can produce this huge reduction in healthcare uh, service uh, utilization, 10 to $15 billion, seeing the same kind of thing. This is recovery housing. Not only these big chain, big improvements in terms of substance use, abstinence, employment, and reduced incarceration, but at a savings of almost $30,000 per patient over a two-year period relative to going home uh, and going to outpatient treatment, for example. We're seeing the same kind of thing in recovery community centers. The vast array um, of services that are provided in these recovery community uh, centers, these are kind of like places where people can go during the day and get access to the building materials shown here, the building permit, the building materials, go, get access to employers, get a job, get back into school. And what we're finding too is that by doing that, they start to improve their optimism and hope by gaining recovery capital. And that recovery capital leads to these other indices in terms of uh, reducing stress and improving uh, quality of life and functioning, which in turn leads to um, uh, better outcomes. So I'll stop there because I'm out of time. I don't want to burden you too much, but thank you so much for, for having me and I'll be around for, for questions and please email me. If you're happy to help. I'm happy to send you these slides or any of the papers. Uh, please email me if you have other questions about this, but really fundamentally it's about connecting the dots, connecting the dots between our more expensive services, our less expensive services, create a recovery oriented system <laughs> of care that can help support people, again, these more complex forms of substance use disorder, what we call addiction, who have the hardest time getting and staying in remission. Um, and, you know, it's all, it, it's, it's fantastic that we've gotten a lock zone that we can prevent overdose. But what do you do when you prevented, you brought someone back from an overdose? How can we connect them with services that can sustain remission over time? This is one of the most important things that we can do nationally is not just prevent overdose deaths, but help to keep people in remission over time. So this is really the purpose here. So thanks, thanks a lot. That's, I'm sure uh, Dr. Kelly would, would be pleased to have conversations with you after, because you may have leave us the floor. So I have a question for you. Can you go back to your previous slide? Previous slide? Yes. So it seems to me that if we increase self-esteem, quality of life, and um, psychiatric decrease health, yeah. yeah, improve those kind of things, yeah, yeah. early on, then we don't need to focus on addiction, right? I mean, it, it seems to me that you know you point to the social aspect of all this, which I think is true. But my point is that you know, we focus in, in, in recovery because we have a population that finds that self-esteem, quality of life, and everything is not at a level and leads to addiction. So shouldn't we focus on improving those parameters early on so we don't need to deal with addiction? Yeah, addiction? Uh, you're right on. Of course, you know, pre and prevention efforts do try and do this. They try to get out ch children's self-esteem and their, their value and, and, and 
uh, tuned into social mores. Yeah, you're quite right, exactly. Um, but it's interesting. Some people who have, not everybody, they are risk factors. So low levels of those, as you're alluding to, is, is are risk factors. But you get plenty of people also with high self-esteem and high quality of life who also will end up addicted. So it's the, while they are risk factors, there are also plenty of people who get into the addiction without having those. Uh, so just other kinds of susceptibility. But you're quite right. In general, we can do a lot more in terms of prevention through focusing on building self-esteem and, and these other things. The prevention end is, is the comparison with other societies that they are socioeconomically equivalent to the, to the one in the United States, that they don't have the level of addiction that we we, we see here. Yeah. I might be wrong. I'm, you know, I'm not an addiction expert. Yeah. But but you know I I, I look at Scandinavian countries, for example, yeah. that they do have a quality of life that is substantially better. Yeah. Yes. And they are not, you know, having the same or at least apparently they don't have the same level of addiction here. So it seems that there is a model where things work. Maybe we should it's complex, definitely complex, but you're you, you generally right. There's high, high levels of alcohol addiction in a lot of Scandinavian countries also. Yeah, but that, that also has a lot of, uh, there has a, an explanation with the way that they are, uh, uh, life, you know, the, their exposure to the, the, the dark and, 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 and light cycles are because of the extreme conditions, right? But it's not associated necessarily with self-esteem. Yeah. On the other hand, Iceland, for example, Iceland, you may know about the Iceland story. I was just there last month. They've got a very powerful prevention program that they, 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 they've evaluated now over 25 years, showing very powerful effects because they had very high rates of underage alcohol and other drugs. And they implemented this universal, and they can do it in Iceland because it's a fairly circumscribed uh, country and population to very good effect. So there's a lot we can learn into, from these international cross-cultural uh, studies. Yeah. So, do, so should we end? Yeah, I know people. Uh, feel free, I'll stick around. I'm not, I'm not sure what's next, but I, I, mean, I think I've got a few minutes before, uh, if, if you have questions for me. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I guess I'll message that the capacity needs to move the progress of the process. I'm going to be speaking to you.